Hear ye, hear ye, Madam Chief Justice and Justices of the Supreme Court of the State of Michigan. All persons having business with this honorable court are admonished for God and I give attention to the court is now sitting. God save the United States, the State of Michigan, and this honorable court. Good morning, and thank you for being here. We have four arguments on application this morning. In, in each of these cases, there will be 15 minutes per side for argument. There will be a two-minute free fire period in these arguments, which may, of course, be waived by the attorneys. Uh, the appellant may also, at his or her discretion, reserve a reasonable amount of time to respond to the appellee's argument. Um, as I'm inclined to say at these sorts of things, your arguments, I believe, would be most helpful to the court if you recognize first that the justices are each conversant with the basic facts in your cases, and second, that the court is committed not only to resolving your case in a just manner under the law, but also to, de to developing the law of our state so that it is equally just in its resolution of similar cases arising throughout the state in the years ahead. This is the second of our two days of argument in March, and we look forward to the arguments. First one will be Keith Todd versus NBC Universal. Please proceed. Good morning, and may it please the court. My name is Jeff Steinport. I'm representing Keith Todd, the plaintiff and appellant in this case, and I would like to reserve three minutes for rebuttal. Uh, and I will wa wave. Could you speak the, up a little bit, please. Uh, and I will waive the uh, the two-minute uh, free free fire period. Um, this case, uh, in particular, the, the three issues that this court uh, asked us to do additional briefing on, uh, is 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 a, is one of the first issue is one of context and the relationship of the parties. And uh, MSNBC tries to make the argument here that 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 context shouldn't and does not apply in, in sort of a media defendant situation or context, uh, but they don't provide any any sort of case law to support that position. Uh, they only they only list the cases that we list that are from Michigan law that that apply that sort of contextual approach, and they say all of these cases uh, have some sort of personal relationship between the parties, and that, and that precludes a media defendant in, in that sort of analysis. But um, use of that word relationship is very narrow in the sense that they're, they're trying to apply it here. Uh, what the restatement says and what courts in Michigan have uh, agreed to and, and adopted is that that extreme and outrageous factor of intentional infliction of emotional distress can be uh, overcome or uh, adjusted based on the abuse by the actor of a position or the power to affect his interests. Now, it doesn't necessarily say there needs to be a relationship one-on-one -on -one where you and I, a teacher versus a student, or a mortgage company versus a, a, a mortgageor. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's about the position. It's not necessarily about an individual one-on-one -on -one relationship. It's a broader term for relationship. Now, uh, my client, Mr. Todd, he wasn't, he, didn't, he wasn't given the choice to be put in this relationship. NBC, MSNBC made the choice to add him to their, their video and accuse him of criminal activity, put his photo on the, the show, and, and claim this is the guy that you're watching getting tased and chased by the police and stealing a limousine. Well, he wasn't. He didn't have a choice in that, and he wasn't contacted and asked, are you the guy involved in this? MS, MSNBC did that on their own, uh, either intentionally or recklessly, as we well, allege. Let's, let's talk about that. Where did they get the information? Uh, MSNBC? Yes. Uh, this is a hor uh, we understand this is a very horrible thing to be identified when, it, when you're not the uh, criminal as a criminal. So we understand the circumstance, but MSNBC got the identity of your client, not on its own, but from the police, correct? Uh, we haven't had any discovery at this point, so we don't know exactly how they received Isn't that what you pled? 
Uh, we allege that they received it from the police, but yes. they also acted uh, recklessly in, in verifying the information that they have. So what they did was... Just a moment. Uh, you yes, pled that they got the information from the police. Are you are you saying it, it, they're, the failure to uh, second-guess or check the police information about who the criminal defendant was is an intentional and reckless act? that they cannot rely upon the police department's information as to who the criminal defendant is? Uh, well, our uh, amended complaint did not allege that they received it from the police well, that's department. that's a different so. question. The initial complaint before the court was that you pledged they, uh, pled that they got the information from the police department. I'm trying to understand why that is an intentional, reckless act within the meaning of the, the sort of restatement of torts uh, 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 statement of what constitutes uh, intentional infliction of emotional distress. That's Assuming correct. this is a tort we recognize in Michigan. Yes, that's correct. So the issue is, so they, if, if they receive the information from the police department solely, uh, which they may not have. Uh, that's, what, that's what you alleged. Correct. So the information is, uh, this is the gentleman you're watching on the video. Uh, this is the photograph that they have somehow of him. Uh, the, clear, the two clearly don't match up. I mean, you, you watch the video and it's a very different person you're seeing in the video than they pulled up on, on the, the uh, television show. They, they pulled what appears to be his driver's license photo, uh, his, his actual name and his age. Uh, and and the, the gentleman on the television show is not that person, clearly. Uh, when you talk about the, the criminal record, uh, it doesn't match up with him. It's, it's, it's not him, obviously. Uh, and so even if uh, they received the information solely from the police department, which we don't know for sure that that's the case, uh, they still had a little bit of due diligence to do. And, 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 what and was the due diligence they failed to do? To verify that that's who the, the, the photograph they're placing on the television and then claiming this person is engaged in all so this criminal activity. The failure to verify the information they got from the police was, was, was problematic. Assuming that's the only place that they got that's the information. All we, we're, we're here on pleadings now. We're not here on anything else outside the pleadings. So my question is, can it be anything more than negligence that they didn't do more due diligence, as you say, in, in checking the homework of the police? I, I think it can be, yes. Okay, it's, well, it's, in what way? Because that's be. really important to whether you succeed or not, that you persuade mm -hmm. us that what they did was intentional. Or reckless. Or reckless, yes, that's, that's correct. And, and we do allege that they had a reckless disregard for the truth in the original complaint. Uh, they have editors, they have people viewing the video, they have people seeing what's going on, they have someone who takes that photograph, places it on that editing video. Uh, they have the correct name somehow of, of the person, uh, assuming they have the criminal record, they have the correct name of the person. Uh, it's, 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 it seems unlikely the police department would provide them with a criminal record with the name missing of the actual person who is, whose criminal record that they're reviewing on a television show versus the photograph and information of the person, uh, the correct, uh, the incorrect name of the photograph uh, that they're putting on the television show. So they have but the. You're adding record. more facts than you pled here. I'm sorry. You're adding more facts than are pled. You're making assumptions about what the police did or didn't. Correct, but this is a, a notice pleading situation. Uh, they can't pretend like they don't know the, the issue that we're talking about. I mean, they're, they're aware of their own facts internally and how they came to this conclusion, and they, they've made no uh, explanation on the record at all in affidavits or anything on how they arrived at this conclusion. They, they, they did retract it. They acknowledged that they, they messed up, uh, but uh, they, they claimed that this was a simple mistake in, in pleadings before this court uh, without any uh, reference to the, the record at all, and the, the Court of Appeals did the same thing. They're just saying it was a mistake. They're not claiming uh, that the mistake was the police department. They're saying in their own pleading it was a mistake. So uh, It manifestly was. Excuse me? It That's manifestly right. was a mistake. It was the wrong person that it identified in the program. Uh, the question I think was whether it was an intentional or reckless mistake. 
I don't know that it was a mistake. That, that, that's, that's the situation where we, we, someone had the correct information. If they had the person's criminal record, someone at MSC and MSNBC had the correct information. Someone Counsel, had, yes, in, in attempting to assess the extremeness and outrageousness of what occurred here, how do we weigh and take into consideration the context? In other words, if this had not been MSNBC, but a local newspaper or maybe a statewide newspaper, some media facility with you know less reach than presumably MSNBC has, would that have imposed uh, a lesser obligation or a greater obligation in terms of checking the background and ensuring the accuracy of the information here? In other words, to the extent that MSNBC has the the um, the, the, the distance across the country that it does, was there a greater obligation imposed upon it simply by virtue of that fact than might have been the case if this was a media outlet with a, a lesser breadth, a lesser distance? Uh, you know, I think that, that context can matter, yes. Uh, if, if it's a local media company, uh, perhaps a, a slightly lower standard, but it's a media company and it still has uh, an amount of power that uh, is, is disproportionate in terms of so do client. they have to check three times where it's the local newspaper only two times or no I don't think there needs to be any sort of bright line like that uh, I think due diligence and not acting recklessly is is a, an appropriate standard we do have the case the Hatfield versus New York Times case that we cite in our brief where it was an intentional affliction of emotional distress the New York Times another large media company accused someone of engaging in the anthrax attacks. Well, I understand that outrageous, extreme and outrageous is one typical standard, but I'm wondering whether or not there's something different that must be satisfied in the case of a larger media outlet than a smaller media outlet when it comes to what particular facts satisfy that extreme and outrageous requirement. No, sir, I don't think it would make a significant difference because it's still a media company and it has a, an outsized uh, effect versus the, the plaintiff. I I'm still having difficulty. If, if MSNBC went out and did its own research and came up with the wrong identity, that would be one thing. I, but I'm, I'm struggling with the idea that, as you pled, they, they got the information from the police department that was involved in the arrest of the actual criminal defendant. I mean, do, do your your belief. Your, uh, I'm just trying to understand. What do we have to do when those who are the public servants, like the police department or this court, give out I incorrect information to people and they republish it? I, I, it depends on the nature of that incorrect information. If, if, well, if this incorrect information is that they took a, a name that has two first names, Keith and Todd, and they transposed them. But, but did they? That's the question. Did they provide MSNBC with the correct information? And MS, MSNBC? Why did you plead that they, they, that they got their information from the police? Uh, th that was the information and belief at the time of, of okay. the attorney. Well, so, that's, so that's, that's, those are the facts that we're, lead, that we're dealing with now. Understood. But again, uh, I guess my point... Uh, Do you plead something different in your proposed amended complaint? That the information came from a different source? Uh, <coughs> we, uh, we simply plead that it was... Uh, I'm sorry, it was, I don't think we pled exactly the source that it came from in the amended complaint. We, we, that's you just the removed the allegation that it came from the police. Correct, yes, and we, because we, we, we need to understand discovery. We understand how they arrived at incorrect information. If they received the, the hmm. correct criminal record from the police department uh, with, with the correct uh, criminal's name on it, and, and MSNBC, MSNBC transposed that information and actively looked for my client's uh, photograph and his personal information, including his age, uh, that would obviously be on MSNBC. Uh, they had that information. We, we allege they had that information. Did the police department have your client's photograph? Uh, we don't know. But it still would have to be intentional or reckless. I mean, even if M you haven't pled any intentionality. You don't think MSNBC, who'd never met your client before, was out to get your client and make him suffer. You haven't pled anything like that, correct? 
Well, the pleading did include that it was an intentional act, that they intentionally and, and reckless, both are in the original complaint. That uh, so, if they transposed, if they got, if they transposed the names, if MSNBC did the transposition, Keith and Todd, to Todd and Keith, then why isn't that just negligent rather than reckless? Because the assumption is they had the information. Or the allegation is they had the, the correct information. Uh -huh. they, they, they Obviously, it's not just a, a two-minute process to put together a television show. So somebody transposed it negligently within MS, MS, NBC or whatever it is, and they ran with that. Why well, is that reckless as opposed to negligent? It's, it's, uh, the definition of reckless, uh, is many courts say, is without caring or bothering to find out that the actions may cause harm to someone else. So they... they no, I had the correct. Just the typist transposed them, and nobody caught it. But, but that's not that's not all that was on the show. They didn't just transpose the name on the yeah. show. They got his photograph. They had his accurate age, so they obviously got additional information on my client. That no, I'm just saying, not, once you transpose it, lots of things follow. You say, okay, get us a picture. But, but they have a duty. That they're a very uh, powerful media company to. to do due diligence, due diligence and, and, and accurately report on what they're reporting on, not put a false photograph on, on television uh, implicating someone in, in serious criminal activity, laughing about it, putting a police officer on there, laughing about it. Well, the police it officer, didn't the police officer confirm that that was the name? No, he did not. They, they, okay. they edited it in a way that the police officer was talking generally. The police officer never says his name. They're just saying uh, the over... Uh, okay. the, 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 Overlay audio. The person says the the the, the name. A police officer just says, "Oh, he's not the brightest guy in the world." Ha ha ha. So, something along those lines. So the, the police officer does not say the name one way or another. Counsel, at some point, your client learned that this show had aired, right? And at that point, he brought it to the attention of MSNBC that the information presented was inaccurate. Correct. As I understand, at that point there was some kind of disclaimer appended to the show, is that right? Uh, they retracted the show, yes, and, and, and published a disclaimer. saying did, that it was. Are accurate. you saying they continued to air the show? They did not continue to air it, they, they retracted the show and uh, published a disclaimer. In, in what, by what vehicle, <clears throat> what, what mode did they publish the disclaimer? They, they, uh, it's on the, uh, the DVD and evidence, it's, it's just a, a brief, the show aired, it was incorrect. Uh, I don't remember exact language, but it was basically a black screen with saying a uh, previous show was incorrect. Can I just ask you as a strategic decision, why did you not appeal the statute of limitations issue? Wouldn't it have been the case that each re-showing of the program would have uh, re reinitiated the limitation period? Uh, my understanding of the law is that uh, the initial broadcast, the initial publication is the date of the statute of limitations, and that's uh, pretty strictly enforced. Thank you. Uh, I, I've got a question about your last um, issue, so whether you should have been permitted the right to amend. Yes. The trial court, um, I don't think, actually erred by denying a right to amend under 2116I5 uh, because it dismissed under subsection C7. And under subsection C7, there's no uh, strong suggestion that there'd be an opportunity to amend. And you got to the Court of Appeals, and the Court of Appeals said dismissal wasn't appropriate under C7, but actually it was under C8. C8 would trigger the right to amend. Yes, sir. And perhaps the Court of Appeals should have sent it back to the trial court to ask whether it was futile. But instead, they, they said uh, it doesn't matter here because we don't think it would have made a difference. Correct. Now you're in the Michigan Supreme Court. We usually look for jurisprudentially significant questions. I don't know that you know whether you were given a right to amend is actually jurisprudentially significant. I think it's error correction. Give me your best argument why we should do some error correction for you here. Why isn't it futile? Uh, well, it's not futile uh, because the uh, the arguments that MSNBC makes in terms of the First Amendment arguments uh, don't apply. The Snyder case that they cite at the Supreme Court is about public. Uh, protest, uh, public uh, the discussion of, of, of issues that are of public interest. This is a private individual being defamed by a, a media company, uh, and the, the 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 basis of this is is is, is that sort of private. Uh, they don't they still don't explain how defaming a private individual is but a this isn't matter a of public interest. Claim, is it? That's correct, but but the, the sort of defamatory statements are at the heart of of many of the claims here. 
Maybe even you though, have a good cl defamation claim, but you didn't make that. You made an intentional infliction of emotional distress claim. Well, the defamation, defamation was part of the original complaint. But, but what we're talking about is your new claims that you want to make that you yes, didn't sir. make in the original complaint, right? Yes, sir. So, right. so your so, appropriation claim, for example. Right. Yes. What? Or false light invasion of privacy. Yeah. So, so the, the the argument here is that yes, the the, the court of appeals said it should have been dismissed under uh, C8. Uh, right. They cite the case Labar that where the the court. Uh, Get to why is why this isn't it is, well, the, the, the bottom line is is one of the standards of this court has is is to prevent substantial injustice. My client has cognizable claims. The court of appeals said it, the the statute of limitations is different for different courts. My client attempted to amend his complaint to bring those cognizable claims to the court. But why? Wh the what we're court. trying to ask is why are they cognizable? Right. So, why are they good in other claims? words, the appropriation claim, for example, yes. I think requires your client to have a commercial interest in his name or likeness. And so what what's that? Well there's there's dispute as to, is in terms of, of, of whether there needs to be a, a commercial value to his his likeness or whether or not the a company is making money off of his his likeness. Mm -hmm. And on top of that there's the false light invasion of privacy claim which uh, MSNBC tried to wave away at the Court of Appeals and basically say it just shouldn't be a tort. Uh, they really haven't presented a legitimate argument why that is not applicable here other than their First Amendment argument which doesn't apply to a private figure plaintiff. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Good morning, and may it please the court, Len Nehoff from the Honigman Law Firm on behalf of MSNBC. I would also waive the uh, free fire zone. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Justice Young, I, I would like to begin where you began, because I think this is the critical point. Uh, in the original complaint, there were allegations about how this mistake occurred. It was not an allegation made in passing. Actually, the allegation appears not once but four times in paragraphs 51, 53, 57, and 58 of the complaint. In addition, before the trial court, in the transcript at page 10, the plaintiff's then counsel acknowledged that the case was based on information that was transferred to MSNBC by the East Point police. I appreciate that the plaintiff would like to backpedal from all of those statements, but they were made and they are part of the claim that was dismissed. Um, so if we look at an IIED claim, it's clear as a matter of restatement law that the conduct has to be so extreme and outrageous as to go beyond all possible bounds of decency, atrocious, intolerable. The restatement formulation that's commonly adopted uh, uh, would apply. Can you, counsel, can you, I'm, I'm interested in the question the Chief Justice asked um, your opposing counsel about the, the, the national scope of this uh, and, and what work that does for context. I mean, I read all of your briefing about how usually courts think about a relationship and there was none here. But, you know, for my own preferences, I'd rather be falsely accused by Justice Young here in this building of a carjacking than on MSNBC. That feels far worse to me, to have a national news organization. She took the car. Yeah, see? If he falsely accuses me regularly in the building, <laughs> I don't care. I don't mind in, in, the, in the context of our Just relationship. Just so you know, I was the one who took the car. Yeah. <laughs> I saw you drive. Exactly. With the court's well, permission, can we do a broadcast on this? I think it would be an audience. That would be, now yeah, that would be yeah. good. It's, Just it's to it's tell your client, that would be good television. Okay, there, there we go. I would certainly <laughs> watch it. But do you see my point? I don't, I don't, I, it's even, you know, maybe, maybe the intentionality is, is all that matters here, but you're here and you're, you know the First Amendment, I, I, I believe. Yeah, I am. Kind of, kind of. Yes, yes, Your Honor. You're the guy, so tell us about that. Yeah, so let me say a couple things about that, Your Honor. Um, the first is, is that I think that the Chief Justice's question gets to a line drawing problem that particularly in a field like the First Amendment is immensely problematic. And it may even be illusory. Take, for example, a local paper. Most local newspapers now have an internet presence. And so the trying to draw a line be between MSNBC because of how many people watch its programs and a local newspaper that goes around the world on the internet would probably be a futile uh, gesture, even if it made sense. But more foundationally- Isn't that what advertisers do all the time when they're trying to decide how much money they're willing to pay someone like NBC, for example? based on their Nielsen ratings or however they decide how many people are watching at any given time in various demographic groups versus how many people are clicking on a website. They, there's ways of tracking all these things now. So don't we have very 
precise ways of finding out exactly what your market penetration is? Uh, I don't believe so, Your Honor, because al although you can replicate that with respect to some kinds of data and clicking, for example, on specific stories, it's much harder if you're looking at a website visit, for example, that doesn't tell you on a landing page exactly which story somebody looked at. And, and I, I think it would be odd for a court to create a jurisprudence that was based on uh, that kind of data, like how many clicks occurred on a particular In the site. marketplace, that drives the amount of money people are willing to pay for advertising, but you're saying for us it wouldn't be a reliable measure? No, Your Honor, and I think it would be extremely perilous to start drawing First Amendment lines around this. And, and, I, and I, would add, I would add this, by the way, um, Justice McCormick, also in response to your question. When you look at the Snyder case, which the um, appellant didn't even discuss in his briefing, and which I think is critical here, one of the things that, that Snyder says, and bear in mind that in Snyder we have the most sympathetic plaintiff imaginable, um, the father of a deceased soldier. We have the most outrageous speech imaginable, speech saying that the reason that young man died was because God was taking vengeance against the pure American. Pure opinion speech. I'm, I beg your pardon? Pure opinion speech, unlike here, of course. Yes, that's, that's correct, Your Honor. It, it was Counsel, an expression of the point. Counsel, good morning. I, I just like to, you know, I, I like to ask a question that kind of gets right to the heart of it. Do you like the rest of us. Yeah, no, 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 no. I, 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 what I mean is I, I, I like to ask it. I like her dumb question. <laughs> no, 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 no. I, I mean it this like. This is a carjacker we're listening to now. <laughs> yeah, exactly. The cameras are still rolling. It's all perspective. A blind carjacker. Exactly. <laughs> Like I say, that, that's what makes it more exciting. No, no, but what I mean to say is I, I sometimes like to ask kind of a more simplistic question that, you know, that kind of goes, that, that I think kind of goes to the essence of Good kind recovery. of how I like to see this. How I like to see this. But my question to you, counsel, is um, did, did your client do anything wrong? Absolutely not. Well, certainly not by the standards of intentional infliction of emotional distress. And, Your Honor, you can't the, admit they made a mistake. Oh, sure, of course they made a mistake. Okay, of right, course they made a mistake. Okay. Yes, Your Honor. And, in fact, I think it's interesting that Mr. Steinport, in response to your questions, kept saying they, they needed to do due diligence. Due diligence is the language of negligence. Due di diligence is the language of but mistake. But, counsel, what type of a – if I'm watching this program – is this a what type of program is it? Would you cons is it a news program? Is it's it fake entertainment? News. It's but, MSNBC. It's, right. What what what, <laughs> what what like what kind of a program? What how would you define this program? Like what kind of program is this? So, Your Honor, there are a couple different ways you could answer a question like that. One would be by reference to the individual MSNBC, for example, broadcast standards, and I'm not sufficiently what familiar with that. What kind of genre that. is this? Program? What kind of genre is this? Yeah. I would describe it this way: it's a public interest genre. It's stories that are of interest to the public. And this is of interest How to the public. How is this of an interest? So I guess my question is, so if I'm, this is like a cop show. So am I watching this show because of, uh, the show presents a public interest to me? So if I live in Honolulu and I'm watching this program about East Point, is that a public interest to me in Honolulu? Absolutely, Your Honor, because this is about an arrest, this is about a pursuit, this is about a crime. And I it's think it's not entertainment. This is this is I'm watching this I'm watching this because here in Hawaii I'm I am concerned about what is happening with this guy in East Point. Well, Your Honor, if you look at the at the standard that's announced by Snyder, by the Supreme Court in Snyder. Public interest is a very, very broad standard. The public interest is actually so expansively concerned that the court contrasts it with just one other kind of situation, which is a matter of purely private concern. This is plainly not a matter of purely private concern. It's an arrest, it's a pursuit, and this could have been tragic. I grant you that as it turned out, there is some entertainment value in seeing it the guy run around. It could have been tragic, around, but, but it was, but the, the, let's, let's, let's focus in a little bit on that if we could. So the, the question I now have is, is, is that, in this situation, let's change, uh, like we know we're going to talk about shocking and outrageous, and let's change the nature of the crime he's accused of. Here, you have a person, they're living in East Point. It's clear this person did absolutely nothing. The only thing this person was doing was breathing, and now they're basically accused of being a carjacker. So the question I have is, is that would the facts change? Let's say hypothetically, in terms of this, uh, if it's, you know, if, if the public would say this is outrageous, what if you got a situation where you were doing something about, where you did a program and you had a kindergarten teacher who was, and you accidentally highlighted a kindergarten teacher and you basically got them confused with a child molester. Now, would that change the, would the, the, the nature of the crime and what the person is being accused of, would that then change the discussion that we're having? I don't believe so, Your Honor, because I think the questions would still be the same. 
The questions would still be, was the conduct extreme and outrageous? Did it happen intentionally, or was it the result of a simple mistake, as happened here? Um, is, it, is this a, a case where it was a matter of public interest, um, or was this purely a matter of private interest? So I believe the questions would all be the same that we would apply in that case. So the, the issue then would be then, so you have a person, they basically, they're a teacher, they've dedicated their whole life to teaching. You then, your client just simply makes a huge mistake and gets them confused and, and runs their picture and says that they were arrested for child molestation. Now that follows them around pretty much for their entire life. No matter where they go, what they do, they're always gonna have that with them. And ultimately under the analysis that you're giving, there would be no remedy for that individual against your client? Your Honor, let me, let me say this. The critical fact here is, as pled, we got this information from a police department. It was not in the first instance our mistake. It was the police department's mistake. It cannot be intentional, it cannot be reckless, it cannot be extreme, it cannot be outrageous to rely on what a police department tells you. In your hypothetical, if that were the case, if this was information that was received from a police department, I think we would have probably the same case we have here. But if the information was gleaned in a different way, it's possible you could have a different case and it's possible there might be a remedy. But so under does, these it just, facts, does it matter, is your analysis then it just simply has to, if it, that it has to come from the police department? What if it comes from another government agency? Does it, is there a distinction between the police versus another source that you're using? Well, it's interesting, Your Honor, because the Michigan compiled laws at MCL 600.2911 say that if you receive information from a police department or from any government entity and you report on it, you cannot be sued for defamation. You cannot be sued for slander or libel. And it is basically the legislature's adoption of the same policy that's reflected in the law. If you received it from a responsible governmental source, there should not be a tort action that can be based upon it. Counsel, can I follow up on um, Justice Bernstein's question? Uh, if, if this court concluded I'm not saying you, you would agree with this, but if this court concluded for some reason that this was largely an entertainment program, presumably weeks in preparation rather than a news program, presumably hours, even minutes in preparation, and a significant purpose of this entertainment program was not to communicate any nationally meaningful news, but to encourage a laugh at Mr. Todd's expense, would that context be relevant in your judgment in assessing whether there'd been satisfaction here of the IIED standards? Your Honor, I believe that under the tort law... Just would it be relevant to, con to consider those factors in assessing this? These are what I believe are the relevant factors. And no, I, no, I, I, that's not my question. Yes. I understand you don't... You would I'm reach trying a to different answer your conclusion, question, But if that's the conclusion this court reached, would those be legitimate considerations so, in, in supplying context for our analysis of whether the IID standard had been satisfied. Apologies, Justice Markman, I was, I was trying to answer your question. I was I'm, doing it in I'm our sorry. I'm sorry, then. Um, so uh, I, I do not believe that the fact that this is an entertainment program versus a news program changes the analysis. I don't believe that changes the analysis at all. We still have the questions of is it intentional, is it reckless, is it extreme, is it outrageous? Also under Snyder, um, Snyder is uh, concerned with this idea of outrageousness, and I, want, I think this is an important point. If In the, the context Michigan, of an opinion, once again. Yes, but, but, Your Honor, this is what I think is critical about Snyder. If the Michigan legislature tomorrow passed a statute that said all outrageous speech can be punished, there is no question that that statute would be unconstitutionally vague and overbroad. No question whatsoever. So the question is, can we adopt a common law principle that punishes speech for being outrageous without running afoul of the Constitution when we know that if we did it legislatively, it would? And the answer to that is quite obviously no. So I think that those uh, issues that you're identifying, I understand why they make the case more sympathetic, but I don't believe they change the legal analysis at all. And there is no more sympathetic case than the Snyder case, where the Supreme Court observes calling what Mr. Snyder went through emotional distress is to understate the, language, the level of anguish that but he the suffered. Supreme Co oh, well, as we don't have to get to the First Amendment question at all unless we conclude that uh, the plaintiff here pled intentionality or recklessness, I suppose. But we haven't recognized either tort. This court hasn't. And 
is there a distinction? Are they separate torts, intentional infliction of emotional distress and reckless infliction of emotional distress, or are they the same tort? Because I, I don't think he's pled intentionality. Maybe he's pled recklessness. I'm not sure. Maybe he's only pled negligence. But I think if there's any play, that's where it is. Is it a different tort, reckless infliction as opposed to intentional infliction? Justice Larson, I think you're raising two questions. Let me try and answer them in the, in the sequence in which you pose them. First, I agree with you completely that you do not need to reach the First Amendment question if this fails as a matter of tort law. As to your second question, the way that the tort is defined under the restatement version, the intentional component of the test can be satisfied either by a showing of intentionality or by a showing of recklessness. So it is one tort. But it is that very high elevated level that is completely inconsistent with what we see with what we see here. The restatement second frames the question as whether the recitation of the facts to an average member of the community would arouse his or her resentment against the actor and lead him to exclaim outrageous. Might not it well be that many members of the community would predicate that assessment of outrageousness upon whether a show is a legitimate show new show, the MSNBC Nightly News, or a program designed to have a chuckle at you know, a bumbling criminal? Wouldn't Honor, that be exactly the kind of thing that might be a factor in causing a person to say, that really is outrageous, given what the, what the type of show is? I'm not saying you have to agree with that assessment, or that I would, or anyone else might be, but couldn't it be a factor that might cause some decent members of the community to say, that is a particularly exacerbating factor in this outrageousness determination. Your Honor, may I answer? Sure. Uh, so I'd like to answer both by reference to the tort law and by First Amendment law. With respect to tort law, it's clear that the standard here is extremely high. Justice Markman, in a dissenting opinion that you filed in the decline of review of the Melson case, you cited a case that I think is pretty compelling. It was the one about the person who had been stalking and leaving axes all over the place and things like that as sort of scary signs. I think that's a case where you can look at it and say that is extreme and outrageous. I don't think when you look at the cases that have recognized that there's a jury question that this comes anywhere close to it as a matter of tort law. As a matter of First Amendment law, you have exactly identified the problem. It is plausible that there are jurors out there who would find this extreme and outrageous, just as there were jurors who awarded $10 million to Mr. Snyder in Snyder versus Phelps. But that is not sufficient for First Amendment standards. It's not a sufficiently clear uh, framing of the legal issue. Counsel, could, uh, your time is up, but you, you still have to answer when we ask you. Mine's not. <laughs> last, last time I checked, it was your time. You yeah. argued, so. um, can you address the, um, the motion to amend for, for a minute? I, 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 Justice Sara correctly stated what I understand the rule to be on a C7 motion, although does it matter that the trial court didn't if the trial court had heard the motion and denied it, I'm not sure what argument counsel would have. But, but my understanding from the record is the trial court refused to even hear the motion. Does that matter? Um, I, it doesn't, Your Honor. And, and let me refer back to a point that uh, Justice Zara made, which was this is not generally a, an error-correcting court, and it certainly is not an, a harmless error correcting. Oh, court. you'd be surprised. And <laughs> the, <laughs> at least, at least as I understand it. At least as I understand it, Your Honor, that's not I'm the job description. And here, <laughs> there were multiple reasons why this was not, why this motion would have been rejected. It came late. There was no explanation for why it came late, which raises questions about dilatory motive. And additionally, it would have been futile for all of the reasons. Okay, that let's talk about the merits, the futility. Yeah, tell us about the futility. Yeah, why is it futile? So, so, Your Honor, the, there was a request to add two claims. The two claims were commercial use and false light, or uh, misappropriation, excuse me, and false light. Justice Larson, you're exactly right. A misappropriation claim has to be based on some sort of commercial use. It can't be based on a discussion of a matter of public concern. Black letter law, subliminal well, restatement. But you're, you have both. It's a matter of public concern, or at least that's what you argue. But your client's making money off of this, right? You're selling ads, you're making money. You're, it's on cable, so people are paying their cable. So your client is making money from his likeness. Yes, Your Honor. Is that but that, sufficient? He well, seems to think it is. We're not making money from his likeness, Your Honor, in any direct sense, in the misappropriation sense. But the Petigliere case makes clear, and, and the cases are uniform about this, of course, every media entity makes money from the use of images. 
if, if every time an image was used in a newsworthy context, you had to pay people for it, it would deeply undermine the First Amendment. The second claim is the false light claim. The false light claim is, again, as a matter of black letter restatement law, has to allege, uh, has to allege uh, knowledge of falsity or reckless disregard of the truth. It is true, as Mr. Steinport says, that the, his complaint includes the word intentionality. It includes the formulaic recitations. But those formulaic recitations are exactly at odds with Justice Young where you started, which is these, all of these recitations over and over again in four paragraphs of the complaint, statements made to the trial court about how this was a simple mistake. Under those circumstances, both of these claims would be completely futile. They would have been dead on arrival, and there was no reason for the court even to hear it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mr. Steinport, your, your time is up, but let me see if there are any questions that anybody has for, Mr. for you. Sorry, your time is up. Thank you very much.